Hi everyone, I'm Ryan Roulette, Artistic Director of Roundhouse Theatre. And I'm Sarah Rasmussen, I'm the new Artistic Director at McCarter Theatre Centre. And welcome everyone to Inside Look, the work of Adrian Kennedy, Inspiration and Influence. We're so glad that you're here tonight. Um, we'll be talking about the festival of four staged readings and four panel discussions, celebrating and interrogating the amazing work of Adrian Kennedy. And since we have a, a number of uh, McCarter uh, donors and subscribers with us tonight, I want to give you a little bit of a sense of what we do with this inside look. This is really just a chance for you guys, as the people who help make our theaters run, to get a little bit of inside information on the process, on the shows. So we're gonna to talk to three of our four directors tonight. Uh, another one is busy running his own theater company and has a project tonight. So he can't join us. But we're gonna to talk to three of our four directors about the shows, uh, and then we'll open it up to you for some questions if you have questions. So at any point during this, if you have some questions, you could just type it into the chat and uh, we'll get to it towards the end of the, the evening. Uh, so at this point, we'd like to uh, welcome out our panelists, our directors. Great. So panelists, fabulous directors, why don't you just take a moment to um, introduce yourselves, tell us which play that you're working on, and then we'll get started with some questions. Uh, maybe we should start with Nicole. Why don't you start? Oh, Nicole, because, so we don't talk at the same time. <laughs> Sure, fair enough. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Nicole A. Watson. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am the, I guess, outgoing AD of Roundhouse and the incoming AD at McCarter. Um, and I am directing uh, He Brought Her Heart Back in a Box, uh, which will be um, in two weeks. You'll get to see it in two weeks. Val? I'm Valerie Curtis Newton, and I'm uh, in Seattle, Washington, where I teach. Uh, at the University of Washington. I'm the head of directing and playwriting. I also run my own theater company called The Hansberry Project, and I'm working on the Ohio State Murders. And Timothy. And I'm Timothy Douglas, and I'm Zooming in, or I guess it's not Zoom, I'm streaming in from Boston, where I teach scene study at Emerson College, and I'm directing Etta and Ella on the Upper West Side. So I thought tonight uh, to start, uh, it would be great to hear a little bit from each of you about uh, your experience with Adrian Kennedy's work as a whole. Um, and, uh, you know, and if you could just tell us a little bit about the play that you are directing. Uh, Nicole, why don't we start with you again? Okay, sure. Um, You're up first. <laughs> that's great. Um, my experience with, Adrian Kennedy's work, um, my theater advisor, uh, I should say my thesis advisor when I was in grad school, Michael Dinwiddie, I have no idea what I said to him, but his response to me was go to the library now and check out this play. And it was Funny House of the Negro. And um, my thesis project changed overnight. Everything I was interested in changed overnight. Um, and I sort of just um, fell in love with her work and have always been inspired by the play she writes and the story she's trying to tell. And two years ago, I had the chance to do a reading of one of her plays and it sort of, I guess, reminded me of my um, love for her and curiosity of um, putting her work on stage and asking and sort of wanting to see her in the world more often. So yeah, I, I owe it all to um, my graduate thesis advisor who, again, I wish I knew what I had said to him that, <laughs> told him to go check this book out, but it was I forever changed. I'm probably in theater because of reading that play. And I should add that it is really because of Nicole that this entire festival is taking place. We had been talking for a while about doing a festival of new play readings, and Nicole kept saying, you know, if we're going to do that, we should really honor someone in the past as well. Uh, there are so many voices, particularly uh, uh, people of color who are, who, who run the risk of really being forgotten. And, uh, and we, started rereading all of these plays and and kind of took it from there. So it, it, Nicole has really been producing this entire festival while directing her own play. Nicole, will you tell us just a little bit about your play? Sure, let me try. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, He Brought Our Heart Back in a Box is, um, you know, it, I, I use the term love story loosely. It's about two young people um, in 1941 who, I think are trying to find their way to one another. Um, the gentleman is white 
the girl K is black. And uh, I think that what they're unearthing is the difficulty of how we keep secrets of history and the thing, the, the fact that history and our uh, perhaps unwillingness to talk about the past honestly um, only sort of perpetuates ongoing trauma for everyone involved. I, I think that's what we've been talking about in rehearsal. Uh, <laughs> but um, it's it's a mystery. It's, uh, you know, I think it really sort of is a reminder that we have a ways to go and, and that we have to find language for the the pursuit of, of uncovering our, our paths, uh, our past and our future, I think. <laughs> Uh, what about you? I um I encountered uh, Adrian's work um, actually like thirty years ago, and I I didn't understand it, and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm really clueless about theater. And then uh, I spent some time with it and realized that all through our Black theater history, there have been these multiple threads of uh, realism that tells story in a particular way. And then these pageant, ritual, theatrical, uh, mind-bending kinds of work that goes all the way back into the, the early, early 1900s. And so that figuring out that balance and then trying to figure out where I fit in that was, was really, really challenging for me. Like I, like Nicole, I read Funny House. And I was like, Patrice Lumumba? Really? Uh, <laughs> Queen Victoria? Um, then I read a movie star has to star in black and white. And I got super enthused by the idea that you could conceive of people who look like movie stars. And she wrote this play with these images. Um, I, I, I taught... Uh, and in this survey course that I was doing about black women writers, she's got such a pivotal voice. Um, and uh, she also takes on the really big issues of what it is to be black in America. And she will find and morph forms to make it work. So I'm directing the Ohio State Murders and almost everything that Nicole said about the piece that she's working on could be said of Ohio State also. It's a mystery and it's about this the big relationship between black people and white people and institutions. It's about uh, self-discovery and, uh, and figuring out how as an individual black person, you fit in the world and navigate between the black and the white. Mm -hmm. um, and the potential is always there to fall in the cracks and be lost. Um, it's a play that takes place in, we're going to do it basically in the present and also in the late 1940s, early 50s. This idea of memory and the present is sort of a recurring theme in her work. And, uh, and I'm really excited to be doing this, this project. Thank you. Amazing. And Timothy, we gave you the, the, the newest play of the bunch, one that has never been done before. And maybe the most, uh, uh, like a lot of a, a lot of writers, she has gotten more uh, spare uh, as she's gotten older. And it is the most, maybe the most complicated of the bunch. Although that's hard to say. Tell us a little bit about it in your that's history. Hard to say. I I um, managed to uh, delay my meaningful encounter and experience with Ms. Kennedy's work until this project. I, of course, when I got serious about theater, uh, I knew of her work. I read, tried to read Funny House of a Negro. And there's a, a, a seriousness about her work, about her personhood. I was too immature to discern what was what. So she impressed me as a very serious black artist at a time where I was not ready to be serious. And so I, I knew she would be someone and her work would be something to achieve. And I just sort of gave it a respectful place and, you know, on the many shelves of my theatrical life. And 
never felt I was ready. So I thank Roundhouse and McCarter and, and um, Nicole specifically for inviting me to this journey because now, uh, you know, given, given just how topsy-turvy the world is right now, encountering Adrienne Kennedy with my former impression now feels like she kind of makes sense or I don't feel alone in how fragmented reality has become for me specifically. And so I feel very confident entering the world. I'm not encumbered by preconceived ideas about what and I, you know, what Adrian Kennedy's work needs to look like or feel like or sound like. And I, I am I'm being a little bit flip, but I'm I'm mostly serious about all of that. Um, Etta and Ella on the Upper West Side, among other things, deals with a very complicated relationship between sisters, Etta and Ella. And the aspect that is most intriguing to me right now, both are I, identified as artists, as writers, and how liberally one borrows the other one's experiences to write about. Um, that is sort of an ultimate, you know, co-opting. Uh, and though I don't believe, well, that's not true. I was going to say, I don't believe there is a, um, an equal thread of, of relationships between white and black characters, although there are, are white uh, figures referenced in the piece. And I don't know yet how prominently they figure, so I don't know how much of this is actually about race, but it's certainly a response of a complicated, gifted black artist to black artists in a, in a world that is not readily receiving them and they sort of feed on each other. Um, that's where I am now. Um, I am uh, appropriately um, humbled by the the journey being female driven. Um, I, I really mostly enjoy working on work penned by women. That, that's just been my journey and of late been getting a lot of opportunity to do that. This one's gonna make me work and I'm okay with that. Okay. <laughs> that's terrific. I, I love something Val said about the the interplay between memory and the present in these plays, and that it's so it's so fluid. And I I'm so curious about that in your process right now and your conversations, getting started with your casts about um, both the world that these plays were written, and then of course how that is bumping up against um, really long overdue conversations right now today. Can you talk a little bit about how past and the present moment are are living in your conversations? Oh, Valerie's muted. I'm sorry, that was me. There's there's workers going on outside, and so I didn't want to distract from what Timothy was saying. Um, uh, for me, the the past and the present in the play are there's a a woman who is reflecting an incident from her past, and she's doing it in a lecture. She's in a lecture, and then she, there are these moments that sort of pop up and out. Um, and then live in their own, and the mystery is sort of revealed through the, the characters in her past. Um, and uh, I think that this the, that sense of past and present sort of weaving back and forth and coexisting is a part of a kind of mindset that's a, a survival mindset. It's like, I have been through this and worse in the past. I can get through what I'm going through in the present because of that past experience, memory, uh, wisdom. Uh, but there is a kind of wisdom when she, when she zips us back and then gives us more information to go forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's such a, I think for me, it was such a, an exciting quality of her work because I, I was a history major and a history teacher before moving to theater. And so when I read her plays and she was inserting herself into movies and inserting her life into, or seeing versions of herself in these historical figures, I was just sort of blown away by that idea that she was like, you know, of course I want to see myself in the work. I want to see myself on stage. And I think Adrian was like, even when I don't see me, I'm inserting myself into this world because I'm here 
and I've been impacted by it and I'm impacting it. And I think I just, I just really love that power that I thought she brought to her work, even as she was writing about things that were profoundly traumatic, profoundly upsetting, you know, about like her son being beaten by the police, like, but she still had this sort of like pursuit of like, I'm here and my work is informed by all of my experiences and, and moving forward with that. Like, I, I just, I was always captivated by that, that she didn't just like say, here's the one thing that motivates me. <laughs> she said, like, everything is for me. And I put myself into this world, you know. Um, I, just picking up on that point, uh, Nicole, I, I'm interested a lot in the fact that Ohio State murders doesn't have like someone going back to Africa, doesn't have like some usually historical figure that she's sort of staying in the world of the experience at that time, which is unusual uh, on the range of her plays where there's so often, you know, there is like Queen Victoria and Patrice Lumumba and this great, great, great um uncle from seven generations ago who just yeah. like walks through and walks past. Yeah. Um, so the layers and the way that the layers play out is really interesting. But doesn't she, the, the English teacher, I forget what book they're reading. I guess like to me, it's interesting that like also in some of the plays, she like goes to the theater and then like is like, I don't want to talk about Hamlet and then uses Hamlet to talk about, <laughs> exactly, yeah. like, you know, I don't know. I don't think it's Jane Eyre. I can't remember, but like they're reading. It is. is it Jane Eyre? Yep. And then is like, I don't want to talk about Jane Eyre. I'm going to use that book to talk about. So like, she's always, it's like, she's almost like pointing out the alienation of what it means to be black in a world that is privileging white stories and white, like, and is like, yeah, I, and then like takes the detour and is like, I, I'm not here for that, but I'm going to use that to tell you my own story. Like I, I, I don't know. I find, I just find that really fascinating. Well, because, because all that information is there. Yeah. Like it, it's, it's how we navigate the world. Yeah. Yeah. The, the parallel discovery for me is this medium that we're presenting this work in. And for whatever reason, I've had opportunities these last several months to engage this medium as a way of trying to figure out how to tell theatrical stories. And so in, in many ways, um, really discovering and investigating um, Adrian's work for the first time with this medium, it gives me this whole other, not unexplored, but lightly explored um, avenue to to make sense is not the thing that I really mean, because I mean, you know, she doesn't need that for me. I, I need to come to her in her own terms, but I need to make sense of it for myself. And knowing that I'm going into a primary imagistic a medium that's leading the storytelling is forcing me to think about it in a different way and automatically out of the gate has opened my mind in a way that I don't think would be happening if I were doing a traditional traditional stage version, a stage version. Boy, that seems so long ago working in theaters with that person. I call it traditional now. <laughs> wow. So I'm curious to hear a little bit about, I mean, you brought this up, Timothy, this medium that we're working in, which is hard to explain to people because we are doing stage readings. These are not full productions, but we're not doing a Zoom reading of this, which, because, you know, our, our theory is that so many people are watching Zoom all day long that they don't want to watch Zoom yet again. We're actually bringing the actors to the theater and filming it on the stage I know that none of you have actually started this process of filming just yet. We don't do this until this Thursday, but I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit about how you're trying to capture this on camera, or, or at least at this point in your thinking, what are you thinking about visually for it? Her work is so visual and we really tried at the beginning, we said, you know, we're gonna not pick the plays that are um, so incredibly visual like Funny House that we just couldn't possibly make sense of them in this medium. And yet, uh, you know, as we're digging into these plays, we're finding that like, yes, these are a little bit more uh, easy to follow in a sense, but these are complicated, complicated plays that have really rich imagistic uh, worlds. Nicole, you're starting first. 
you've had a little bit more time to dig into this. How are you capturing it? What are you doing? Well, I've sort of talked about it uh, um, as a sort of collage. And I think that's how I think about her work. You know, she has this autobiography called People Who I, Who Led to My Plays. And it's like a photo journalistic thing of like, who influenced me? When I was a kid, Dracula. As I got older, Betty Davis. Always my mother. You know, like, again, just always having um, uh, accessing anything that is of interest to her. And so I always think of her work as a collage. And so I've talked about what this medium is, is that like, it's a staged reading with like, some post-production bedazzling. Um, so um, I'm working with a, you know, one of the designers, Kelly Colburn, um, we've talked about how we might like overlay some of the actor text with images. In, in this play in particular, there's, um, there's a storeroom um, that is referenced that you don't actually see in the play. And in that storeroom are sort of the relics of um, racism and segregation. And so what we've talked about is how do we sort of collage some of those images over the actor text? So you get a reference for these things that she's described in stage directions and people talk about, but we're still moving the play along with the, the actor storytelling. So it, it's like an interesting thing because if I was doing this on stage, how would I capture again? Like, is that the props designer creating every little thing versus you know, an abstraction of it. So for me, it like offers a nice opportunity to think of both what is the like realism of her play and then what is the the sort of surly, surrealism in the image of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of what I, uh, we've been working on. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, I love actors and they are the ones who are, you know, figuring out this story and trying to track the journey and asking great questions. And so, yeah, for me, it's like, you're going to hear the actors, you're going to see them, and then there'll be some image bedazzling <laughs> to accompany them and sound and everything. So that's that's where a heart in a box is. Um, yeah, and I thought uh, that everybody was going to be present in the theater, but I but that's not really true for yours. You have one actor who will be off site. You will be directing it from Seattle, and the actors will be present in the theater, which will be interesting to see how we do that <laughs> leads me to i have no idea how we're going to do this i'm really honest i've got no idea i mean i think that again to sort of point to the ways in which the work lends itself to certain things the elements of something that feels sort of realistic that grounds us you know suzanne's lecture she's older and she's there doing a lecture and then these flights of fancy, these images from her past, and also part of what she's saying in her lecture, come to life, and the, that's what that's where the actor, the other actors are going to be. But our Suzanne will be off site uh, delivering the lecture, and then all of the memories and the images are going to happen in the space or in virtual backgrounds and. Uh, as Nicole said, the bedazzling, the post, the post production editing bedazzlement. Um, uh, how do we allow for this idea of memory and image to coexist with the reality of the speech that's being given? And um, the other thing is, you know, the, the big first thing, and maybe because it's Kennedy, it's easier. Is for me, I'm so um, set in my ways. The idea that Zoom is theater just is not, that's not a part of my reality. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that's what we're using and I get it as it relates to new work in particular. But, you know, the, the example I use is when I go to church and the preacher is really good, I have to stand up. The hairs on my arm stand up. When I'm watching a televangelist on a Sunday morning, I rarely stand up. It doesn't mean it's not good. It doesn't mean there isn't food for my soul in it, but it doesn't make me stand up. There's no communion in it. And so I feel that way about this work that we're doing. It will give a point of conversation. It will gather some people. But um, but for me, it's not theater. Even if the actors are alive doing a thing, there there's no uh, temperature for the audience. There's no 
real space for the audience to contribute energy to the thing. The actors are talking to a screen. And that makes it more like TV, more like more like film than it is like theater. So again, in this idea of what, how am I gonna do it? I have no idea. I'm a theater maker who's gonna use the tools of this medium to come as close as I can to trying to create communion. In a very short amount of time, we should say yeah. as well. Yeah, in with this three days plus four days of po three days of post, something like that. Timothy, you've got a really interesting idea about yours. I did. <laughs> <laughs> that was so last week. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, Val, I'll, I'll share what I'm. What what's happening for me is, uh, you know, wh when I'm preparing something for the stage, I get lots of images that that feed me emotionally, and I I can um, uh, don't know if I can necessarily stage things literally, but I can certainly be guided by what the images, you know, make me feel. What this medium has done is, you know, it's taken away the physical staging of the actor, but I still get the images. So now I get to sort of lean toward my filmmaking fantasies. I'm not a filmmaker, but but I, I still have the same feeling that the script gives me, and I get to practice, you know, translating that into imagery. So that's been really interesting for me, and because I trust my intuition, I march. I don't claim to be a master of Zoom theater, but I trust the choices that I make every step of the way, and I'm always more, uh, I, I guess, being hard on myself. I guess I'll say I'm less inclined to say i wish i had done it a different way when i walk away from a transmedia project than when i walk away from a live stage of something mm -hmm. that i've staged so i i and knowing you how i know you i think you, i can't wait to see what you do with it um so yeah for me it's like about you know if it were a, this experience were an AG, adrian kennedy play what i'm doing you know she brought the director home in a box i'm somewhere between what I know in my bones staging live theater and my appreciation and fantasy about film and TV. And it's not either of those things. It defined itself for me while I was working on it. And then I get really excited about the possibilities. Uh, Nicole, um, this was just brought up and I think it's a good point. Since Raymond Caldwell's not here tonight to introduce his play, would you tell us a little bit about Sleep Deprivation, uh, Deprivation Chamber? Sure. So uh, Raymond Caldwell is directing Sleep Deprivation Chamber. He's the AD at Theater Alliance, and I think he's premiering some short films that he's made, which I think are short films, not theater film hybrid things that we are still trying to figure out. Um, but he's directing Sleep Deprivation Chamber, which is a play that Adrian wrote with her son, Adam, based on his experience of being um, beaten by an Arlington policeman in his own driveway late run one night and the sort of journey uh, he was then accused of beating up the policeman but it, it, again in that amazing way that adrian puts her life in dream and nightmare like it, it sort of looks at like the abyss between the mother's desire to protect her son and the, her inability to do so because he is now subject to a justice system that is unjust. Um, and again, she does it in her amazing refracted uh, way. So um, yeah, and you know, based on the real event, um, I think 1986 or 84, I can't I remember. Um, you can find the Washington Post article about it. Um, and yeah. It, I guess, it's a beautiful play. Okay. Uh, it's, and, and, it's, and it's graphic and powerful. Yeah. Um, and so, and unfortunately, so timely again. Yep. It was. It was. Yeah. Again, it's the cycle, and it's back again. I was speaking to a journalist the other day who'd read these plays in preparation for writing them, and said, "What well, sleep deprivation chamber? It, it's so profound. It feels so timely." And then he said, "And it also is so profound that it's not written right now. That this is, you know." Um, it, 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 it's been such a, a long-standing thing. And then he also he also um, mentioned too, it's just interesting that, the, of course, the technology was different 
back then that they they weren't capturing things on video camera. It's just one person's word and uh, against an and it. Um, so I thought I thought it's just to me was indicative of how audiences I think are going to find this incredibly compelling right now to hear hear her story. I directed it here in Seattle in the early two thousands, um, and it was because there was a, a rash of police misconduct in the city of Seattle, which is why our city is still under one of those consent decrees out of the Department of Justice. So we had done it then because the police murdered a young man in the, in the, in the south end of the city. Um, but again, the cycle, because the, the cycle of violence, it, it erupts and then uh, simmers and then erupts again. Yeah. It's, I mean, I think that's what's so amazing about her work is that she, you know, she uses repetition a lot. And I think she mm. is like looking at this cycle of repeated history and repeated trauma and like also looking at it in these deeply personal ways, right? Like in Ohio State Murders, I think that like she's starting with the lecture and it was, it's something like, why is there violent imagery in my- Yes. <laughs> and then she's like, well, let me lay out some of my life experiences. <laughs> and, you know, that's, then you'll understand why that happens. You know, that she's always like mashing up the personal and the historical. And I guess I just love that because like history is made by people. You know, it's mm -hmm. not like it's, it's actually not an abstract thing, the fabricated thing. Right. But it is we are we move through it and in it and define it and she's always i think looking at that in this amazing way so. yeah that's brilliant nicole that it's that that the meaning is the form and the form is the meaning in so many ways uh i think that's it's so stunning about her work i'm really curious about this the the elements of surrealism or abstraction in her work the poetic associative quality and i i'm curious about just American theater's relationship to less literal work. Uh, and then how that intersects, of course, with, with female writers, with writers of color. I think there's, there's a big question of why haven't we seen more of this work celebrated on our stages? And, and maybe a hopeful addendum to that, do you think that when we come back to our stages after all we've been through and, and the way we're seeing uh, surrealism on our screens, there's Lovecraft Country, pieces like that. Do, do you think we'll have more of an openness to this kind of form in our main stage American theater world? I, I think it depends on who we decide our audience is. Mm. I, I, I think that there are still large swaths of people who are gonna look at an Adrian Kennedy project and go, duh, I don't get it. I don't get it. and and. Unfortunately, when people don't get things, they get angry. They get frustrated ra rather than thinking, oh, I don't get it. Let me sit here five more minutes and see if I figure it out. Or how about whatever I get is what I get. They don't do that. Um, so it, a lot depends on who we decide our audiences are. We, we will have more skills to tell stories in more ways. Mm -hmm. The question is, to whom are we presenting the work? For whom are we presenting the work? And and maybe it will be different. I'm not sure. Maybe it will. That would be the hope. Um, and I do. I also think that there is a, an element of it, it that is the surreal and the highly theatrical goes with the part of uh, of theater that comes out of ritual and out of community speech. And to the extent that we're interested in doing that. Uh, particularly in the United States, there's more more than enough opportunities for these kinds of forms to live. But we still are, in many ways, the country of the rugged individualist. And we need a strong protagonist in our storytelling, which is different than something that's more ritualized and more communal and theatrical. And uh, so finding that balance, I think, will always be the thing. It depends on who we're talking to. Well said. Nicole, Timothy, any thoughts on this? I'm fascinated by this. It's a big question for me. 
Yeah, it's it's too big for me, but I do have this theory about what this form, this necessary uh, compelled form of storytelling that it borrows from the theater is doing. It's pretty clear to me that even if and when we can go back to more traditional spaces and ways of storytelling, this this is not going away. I feel like this becomes a parallel part of programming. Um, and and if it is successful, it's kind of a perfect model. And so the audiences are being created now. And if and when we do go back on the stage, how we do that is going to be informed by what we're experiencing now. That's going to be a constant conversation. But I think this is the building an audience, a potential audience, that will be willing to come into the space and have that experience and will be willing to take you know, out of the gate, we'll be able to do whatever we want because there'll be such a hunger and thirst to be in the room with the work again. So that's just a, a theory. Uh, uh, and as I said, I well, I didn't say it. I went from great, great resistance, wanting nothing to do with this medium. And in a very short space of time, I, I, I'm actually interested, N not just in this this medium, but in a lot of things now, because so many rules have been broken, both for good and bad, in the current world we live in. And, you know, I do consider myself someone who leans toward the good. Um, I'm no angel, but at least clarity, clarity is what I prize. And this has given me a real opportunity to do it in a different way. And I know it's going to completely influence what happens when I get back into a room with actors again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I I'm I'm with Val on like who are we making the work for? At the same time, I guess there's a part of me, the part of me that like was so drawn to becoming a theater maker, really wants. Well, first of all, people are making theater now anyway, right? Like the the making the theater thing is going to happen, regardless of what doors open or not or anything, theaters being made. But putting theater back on stage in buildings, you know, I just hope, my wish, I guess, is that we can be really brave and bold about the choices we make because like, why not? You know, I just think like, I want the most theatery kind of theater that theater can make when we come back because I don't want to look at boxes anymore, you know? and. And I've binge watched all I want to binge watch. And, you know, I, I, I guess I want, like, as Val said, whatever that huge ritual pageantry music, like, life force thing again. I feel like that's what I'm, I just am going to want because, the, because I want that thing that can't happen here. I think that, that this medium actually is wonderful for artists. Yeah. It's a great tool. I mean, I get to work with people from all over the world. Mm -hmm. Without this tool, I'm, I'm, I'm locked out of the room and the experience. So like, I love Ryan, but I wouldn't be doing this if, if there wasn't the possibility of this technology. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and I did a reading last week, actually, it just closed on Sunday. It was, one actor was in Miami, one was in Los Angeles, the stage manager was in Chicago and I'm in Seattle and we made this and the, and the sound and the sound designer is in North Carolina and we made this thing. I, I don't know what you'd call and the, the playwright was in LA. So we were all able to get into the Zoom room and make a thing and then invite people to see it, which is wonderful. But every single one of us felt uh, inhibited in terms of fully exploiting and expressing the story that we were given. Like we all felt crunched. And uh, so I, I, I was really grateful for the chance to be in the room with all of them and really frustrated because we couldn't quite tell the story quite the way we wanted to. I, you know, one of the things that is fascinating, just, just following up on Sarah's question, as I've reread all of her work, thinking about this festival, you know, we're talking about it in a way that these are complicated plays. These are no more complicated. In fact, I would say, uh, to some extent, maybe even much more relatable than Samuel Beckett or you know any of the leading sort of um, 
writers of, of, of that time period. And it, and it really does, you know, I think it really does beg the question, why, again, why haven't we seen more of her work? What, what is it? Is it simply that as a black woman, she, there weren't enough people, the cultural gatekeepers weren't really allowing that work to happen? Is it that this is not the same kind of work exactly as the absurdist? She sort of is making her own, she has sort of her own style that is unique to herself. I mean, you know, what do you feel like, what do you think caused that? And, and, and as a follow-up to that, really, one of the reasons we're doing this festival is we really believe that Adrienne Kennedy should be considered a major piece of the Amer American theatrical canon. Why? Why do you feel like she should be a major piece of the, of the a theatrical canon? Yeah, I, I don't know what, uh, Val and Timothy, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, but I remember when I was reading about her work in grad school, you know, she was producing plays also when like the Dutchman was coming out. And I, I feel like her work was about like um, a black female interiority that maybe no one was ready to talk about, you know, I don't know. Or, or, or rather the people who have the money or own the buildings or have the power wanted to put on stage. I, you know, I don't know. Um, but it's, if your bar for like producing a play is whether or not you see yourself in the work or you understand the work, then Adrian's work has like, she doesn't get produced because whoever was running theater for the past 30 years was not going to see themselves in her work mm -hmm. or find it accessible. So, you know, I, I guess I blame theater for not producing her theater. I, I agree with you. And I think that she, uh, she was immediately adopted by white elite, elitist avant-garde uh, supporters and benefactors. So that when average, everyday black folks looked at her work, they weren't sure they wanted to go sit at Yale and sit inside those ivory towered places to see the work. Baraka, Leroy Jones was writing things, you know, in the hood with the people uh, for them directly. And so there's a different relationship between the community and his work than there is to the community, a community and Adrian's work. She's writing very black plays, but she's mm -hmm. writing very black plays that were being presented in very white spaces. Mm -hmm. And I think that that inhibited her gaining traction uh, early. And it's only now uh, as we study her more than produce her. Um, Aisha Rahman said the exact same thing, that she had to live long enough for young people to get interested in her work before it was gonna get produced. Because in her time, it was it was too much of whatever too much was to make it to the stage. I love that. I, like, I love the phrase, too much of whatever too much was at the time. <laughs> I mean, I think Nicole, you know, to my to my mind, rereading these again, that thing that you talked about about black female interiority. I mean, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think it, it's a hard until until people see these plays, it's hard to understand what we mean by them. But you know, she has a series of plays where she has essentially written herself into the plays with a surrogate name. Val, you're directing one of them in Ohio State. Suzanne is in Ohio State. Can you explain a little bit more what you mean about that and how it works its way into the plays? I guess, I guess what I think about, and I always say, like, I don't know what Adrian's plays are about. I just know my experience of reading them. And I feel like, you know, she, she's writing, I think, about Black women in moments of despair, right? She's, she's not leaning into the, like, I'm a strong Black woman and I'm going to fit. Like, she's literally leaning into questions of like, how do I see myself? Where do I fit in? There's a, how do I unearth and excavate the fact that like, I'm growing up in a country that doesn't, that I am either invisible or seen in all of these negative ways. Like, I think she's tackling that in a very specific way. And like, you know, one of the things we talked about in rehearsal, because we were talking movie stars to star in black and white, and it was the other actress and I, we were saying, I said, you know, Anna Green Gables is one of my was one of my favorite TV shows growing up. Like I just I, I'm never gonna change my mind about it. 
And yet at the same time, I was never in that world, you know? And, and I think, I think that, I think it's fascinating for me. And I think having the experience of my childhood that I did meeting a playwright who I think was like, I am trying to navigate who I am as a black woman, knowing that so much of the things I've been surrounded by have been filtered through a white lens. Mm -hmm. And I, so, and that's complicated, right? I also think that that's very complicated. And I think she was trying to tackle that. That's what I mean. I don't know what anybody else <laughs> thinks, but that's like how I think about it, you know? Mm -hmm. And her, her response to it is to like, well, I'm putting myself in the world, you know? And, and, you know, and, and I think with um, sleep deprivation chamber, the profound sense of fear and despair that any mother has when they, she cannot protect her child, you know, and she does it in a way that's like, it's, I mean, she, she owns the terror, I think, of what it can mean sometimes to be a black woman in America. I think she really owns it and explores it. Yeah, I think I think that the 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 ways in which oppression functions, the pressures that it puts on you, will break you. And so there's a way in which Edrian's work absolutely shows the fissures and the cracks that come from being under that kind of pressure. It doesn't it doesn't crumble into dust, but it does crack and and. Uh, that sort of fractured nature of the structure of the work reflects the, the pressure under which Black people have existed, Black women in particular, have existed. And, um, and she's sort of saying, look, this is uh, everywhere I go, I'm encountering a push, uh, uh, a, constant, a constant pressure, and it, will, it can make you crazy. There's a kind of insanity that can come from the, the way that oppression works is all pervasive. And, uh, and the fact that we're not all crazy all the time is a testament to something, some ancestral something that's come through and allowed us to still be uh, relatively sane. Yeah. You know, listening to uh, uh, these Black women speak. I'm learning so much. So thank you so much for off offering and uh, your your insights, personal as they may be. It makes me think about my mother, who um, <clears throat> did not have the benefit of any kind of formal education or any obvious opportunities, and lived a very dramatic, if not um, destructive, life. And when I hear uh, both you, Nicole, and <clears throat> Valerie speak about Adrian's work and how I'm absorbing and in getting to interpret Adrian's work, I think, wow, if my mother were able to find at least these words to begin to articulate the challenge of the life that she's living, um, I imagine it would look like the play that I'm directing. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you both for uh, introducing me to the term black female interiority. So we have a few minutes left and we wanna just open it up to some questions from the audience. So if you have questions, please go ahead and throw them up. Um, the first one, uh, we have one from Mitch Dupler who asks, is Miss Kennedy aware of involved in this, in, or, uh, aware of involved in this endeavor? Um, Nicole, you should probably answer this question. She is aware. Um, she, uh, we started an email exchange, uh, during the course of sleep deprivation chamber. Um, and you know, every once in a while she'd shoot me an email and say like, I really like this play. Uh, and then one day I asked to read, I had asked to read, uh, he brought her heart back in a box. And then she emailed me and said, uh, have you thought of doing anything by me? <laughs> Which of course I was all the time. And, you know, um, uh, and so it was with um, real joy, you know, when when Ryan emailed her and said, we'd like to do these four plays. And she wrote back and said that she was really thrilled. Um, you know, she's 89. So she's not really she's involved when she wants to be. So sometimes she'll send photos um, or share thoughts. But mostly this is like she, she, we've been given the go ahead to do this. And uh, I. Um, 
I'm I'm thrilled for it. But yeah, she knows. She knows. Nicole, will you share the thing that she told us about um about about her work and the fact that it hasn't been, you know, that it hasn't been produced very much because I was really moved when she had sent that to us. Uh, I don't I don't know what Gmail you're specifically talking about, but she, in her emails, you know, she said, I recognize that my work doesn't get produced a lot. It's mostly taught. It's mostly academic. And she expressed, you know, gratitude that we were choosing to do these four plays, you know. Um, again, the big hope is that that uh, we do some of these on our stages or, or, or once we can gather again, you know, like I, 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 um, I think I said this to Sarah, you know, the history major in me is concerned with preservation mm -hmm. and the theater maker in me lives in a world that's ephemeral. And so like, I guess like for me, looking at Adrian's work is like making sure that these amazing writers don't, are not lost to us. Cause that to me would be the tragedy. Um, so yeah, she's, uh, um, she's, she does, she, she sends emails every once in a while and, um, uh, we sent her flowers for her birthday and, you know, I, I hope she'll watch or find a way to watch, but, um, yeah, uh, she knows. <laughs> Although you can't ask her questions about her plays. That's the one thing I've discovered. <laughs> nope. 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 She's 89. She doesn't need to answer questions if no. she doesn't want she to. She wrote the play. That's what you got. That's what you figure out. That was her work. You know, you do yours. <laughs> I, I have to say one of the things that I've just been really um, moved by in, in in hearing, you know, in in hearing the conversations that you have had with her, Nicole, is that this is a woman who was, you know, heralded by Edward Albee, for instance, right at the beginning of her career as the next big thing in American theater, right? And yet, where Edward Albee died with many Tony, you know, with, with tons of awards and tons of money having been produced in huge ways throughout the country and through around the world, Adrian's work, which is, I don't think more complicated than Edward Albee's work, is uh, still yet to really get the recognition that it deserves and maybe hopefully, you know, is going to sometime in the near future get it. And the fact that she is so moved that we're doing this, which is, you know, really not, as you said, like this isn't, these aren't, this isn't a festival of full productions. This is a festival of readings. The next hope would be the festival of full productions for these works. I've just been really moved as, as, as she has responded to us about where she's ending her life, essentially, as someone who is such a prominent writer and academic, you know, she taught at some of the best universities in the world as well. Yeah. Well, I think that's the, I guess the other thing that, maybe is worth noting is that there's so many writers that have been influenced by her as much as I feel completely honored that Adrian Kennedy will send me emails. I'm not the only person who gets emails from her, you know? Um, and so there's so many writers and performers and artists who have these deep relationships with her because she was also, as far as I know, and I, I completely like an amazing teacher. And, you know, there are so many writers who are writing today who really, um, name Adrian as being influential on their work, you know? And so, you know, while I'm, I'm grateful that this work is happening and feel very inspired to be like, celebrate Miss Adrian Kennedy, like there's so many people who, who she's impacted, you know, like, and I just, I'm, that to me is the other thing is that there, that her work has, I'm not the only one who she's meaningful to, you know? There's I don't know if you all saw this the other day, but uh, the day that Jeremy O'Harris received what was it 12 nominations for slave play the you know the the most of the he he uh he Kennedy mm -hmm. and he and he reposted that email oh, wow. he was more excited about that email <clears throat> and it seemed like he was about 12 Tony nominations which was kind of amazing you know which also says she's you know in her time right now at 89 and I don't know what she's doing I know she's like she's working on archives and looking at photos but she's also paying attention to what people are doing now, you know, like she, even if she's not going to the theater, she's still paying attention to, to everyone who's making theater and, and, and stuff, which I, I just think is, I, I think that's what we do when we talk about like 
theater families and theater communities, we have there. There is a kind of family tree or a legacy that I, I especially feel as a black woman that has to be honored, you know, um, and and cannot uh, be um, that should not be lost, you know, to to time. In in, in 20, uh, 2016, no, yes, twenty sixteen, I curated a, a, a festival here in Seattle of work by black women writers. And there were uh, bookending productions. One was Lydia Diamond and the other one was Alice Childress. There were uh, 15 uh, readings of new work. And then there was this project that were emerging artists responses to the work of Adrian Kennedy. Oh, wow. I was like, you know, Childress and Kennedy make these two uh, goalposts mm. between which generations of black women have made their work, right? Between the sort of the realism and the, the political realism of Childress and the theatricality of Kennedy, all, all, almost any black woman writer you can think of is writing between those two poles. Even uh, Lorraine Hansberry was inspired by Alice Childress's work. So understanding those two goalposts gives you a context for the breadth of storytelling that black women have been doing forever. And, uh, and to have these women now getting recognized, getting their due, you know, Childress is finally going to Broadway after 60 years of work, she's finally going to Broadway and things like this and, and Edwin's being recognized as an important, important figure in American theater is so gratifying as a black woman in theater between those goalposts. So. That's our next festival or somebody's next festival. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It was, it was wonderful the whole summer. We did it was a summer festival, three months, and it was really, really, really uh, profound for people to see the book of the work. Well, I can tell. Not only are you all three brilliant directors, you're obviously brilliant educators too, because I think we could sit here all night and um, and listen. I've learned so much from this, but I I did just receive a little note in the chat that somehow it's seven thirty already. Um, so I just want to extend my thanks, um, uh, and uh, I think on behalf of everyone watching, thank you for this incredible introduction and invitation into this work, and uh, amen to more festivals that, that illuminate this kind of work and this kind of influence. So Nicole, thank you for having this brilliant idea to, to launch this festival, and, and um, thank you for gathering us all tonight, Ryan. Thanks everyone for their time. Absolutely, thank you all for joining us tonight, and uh, we look forward to uh, having you come and see these amazing pieces. Absolutely. Thank you all. Take care, everybody.